please, this morning, go to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter number 4. 1 Samuel chapter number 4, and appreciate that song. And God with us, amen? And that's truly what Christmas is about. And I hope that God is with us this morning. And I know that He desires to be. The prayer is that our hearts and our lives are ready for Him, amen? God with us, I appreciate that song. Nathan and Nina just celebrated one year, didn't they? And one year, and uh, what a blessing, amen? How many of you were at Nathan and Dina's funeral? Uh, I was going to say funeral. <laughs> I did not mean funeral. I mean, you were at their wedding. I mean, you at their wedding. Uh, I was a very nervous pastor on their wedding day, I can tell you. Not because they were getting married, but because I was sick. And um, it was, uh, I was praying the whole time, amen? And uh, God saw us through it, amen? I, I was literally in the middle of the ceremony thinking, who can I get to finish this wedding for me? And I didn't find anybody that would volunteer, so uh, we just had to get it done. But I, I certainly appreciate these two young, young, they're not young people anymore, and they're, they're bold, amen? And just want to encourage them, amen? And so First Samuel chapter number 4, First Samuel chapter number 4, Look with me, if you would, please, down in verse number 10. 1 Samuel chapter number 4, verse number 10. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli... Hophni and Phinehas were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and the earth was upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon the seat by the wayside watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army. And I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck brake. And he died, for he was an old man and heavy. And he judged Israel forty years. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings of the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law her, and her husband were dead, she bowed herself into travail, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, because her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. A couple of weeks ago, I received a phone call in my office from a pastor. He was in need of just some encouragement. He began to share with me some of the challenges that he was dealing with and some of the things that he was going through and in the labor of the ministry. You know, many times when we think about challenges and when we think about the difficulties in life as it relates to pastor or ministry, we often think that, you know, where we're having a bad day or we're having a bad time because people are struggling or we're dealing with issues in marriages or issues financially or whatever it may be. But the truth of the matter is, is that this pastor's heart was just truly that his people would love God and that they would grow in the Lord and be exactly what God wanted them to be. And he was struggling with some things and going through some things in his ministry. And he made this statement to me and I, I, I just couldn't get past it. And the Lord began to deal with me 
about this message and about our ministry and about the lives of the people who sit in this room this morning. He made this statement to me. He said, you know, Brother Brian, he said it seemed like everything was going well. Everything was going smooth and everything was going the way that uh, we believe that God wanted it to. And he said it just seemed like that one day God got up and he left. And I thought about that for just a moment. He said it seemed like that God just left. And I, my attention was brought to this passage of Scripture where the Bible says that she named the child Ichabod saying the glory is departed from Israel. The glory is departed of Israel because the ark of God was taken because her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, verse number 22, the glory is departed from Israel. The Lord gave me this message and I believe this is the message that God wants for us this morning. And I'm going to preach it and I want you to listen very carefully. I want you to understand, first of all, that I love you and I'm glad that you're here. I'm, I know that no matter what you're dealing with in life, that God has the answer. But I want to preach to you this message and I want you to listen very carefully. When God leaves you alone. When God leaves you alone. Lord, I pray that you'd help us this morning. I pray, God, that you'd work in our life. I pray, God, that you would forgive us. I pray, Lord, that there would be nothing that would keep us from hearing what you had to say to us. Don't allow a man to get in the way, God. If there's anything in my life that would keep you from working, I ask your forgiveness. Lord, empty me of myself and help me to be used for your honor and glory. And may every word that is said this morning be exactly what you want it to be. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We thank you for your blessing in our life. And Lord, I pray that you'd work in this service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. There are several characters in this passage of Scripture, but if you take and you were to go back just a few chapters, you would find a man introduced by the name of Eli. Eli is the high priest, and the Bible says that, that he's brought a young man by the name of Samuel. And he begins to mentor Samuel and he begins to teach Samuel and he begins to train Samuel and, and, and to, to begin to work with Samuel and, and disciple him and to, to give him direction in his life. And the Bible says that this, pro, that this priest, Eli, uh, the man of God, was, was blessed with two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. The Bible says that these two young men were obviously Eli's flesh and blood. They were his, his children. And I'm sure as any father, he loved them dearly. But the Bible says that these two men did not do the will of the Lord. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. And the, the Lord comes to, the Bible says a man of God comes to Eli. And he begins to tell him, Eli, here's what's going to happen. And we get to this passage of Scripture where the fulfillment of God's promise and God's prophecy begins to come true. And the Bible says that the Israelites went into battle against the Philistines. We know that if, if, you, if you know anything about Scripture, that the Philistines always represent the enemies of God. They always represent the world, the things that are in opposition to God. And the Bible says that the Israelites went into battle against the Philistines. And they show up for this battle, and the Bible says that the ark of God, the nation of Israel, the ark of God was in Shiloh, and the nation of Israel was in battle. And they said, hey, we have an idea. Let's take and let's bring the ark of the Lord to the battle, and, and, and that way God will fight for us. And they go into battle against the Philistines, and the story goes, and the truth is, is this, that the Philistines defeated the Israelites. 30,000 men died. The Israelites were defeated by the Philistines. 30,000 men died. And the Bible says there was a great slaughter that fell of Israel, about 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, the Bible says. The ark of God was taken. The Lord says here that the story, the messenger runs and he tells, the messenger runs and he tells the, the, nation, uh, the, the prophet, he comes back to Shiloh and he begins to tell Eli what has happened, what has taken place. And the Bible says that when Eli heard the message, when the, when the people heard the message, that they begin to make much noise. They begin to be 
hurt. They begin to be afraid. And when Eli heard the noise, he asked, what, what's the meaning of this noise? And the messenger comes to him and he says, Eli, I have something to tell you. He says, there's, there's been a battle and there's been a, a great war that's been fought. And the Bible says that he tells Eli that the ark of the Lord was taken. And the Bible says when he heard that the ark of the Lord had been taken, he fell from where he was sitting and died. The Bible says about the same time that Eli's daughter-in-law, Phineas's wife, was with child. And she began to go into labor and to deliver that child. The Bible says when the child was born, she named it Ichabod. Because the glory had departed. There are many people who are living life and they're trying to find an answer. They're trying to find a solution to their problem. They're trying to find the, the thing that's going to make everything right. And the Holy Spirit of God has worked and God has moved and God has tried... Uh, the Holy Spirit has convicted and God has shown you and God has revealed, hey, here's areas in my life that aren't right. Here's areas in my life that I need to make right. Here's areas in my life that I need to get right. Here's things that I need to deal with. And, and God has said to you, hey, here's, here's something that you need to get taken care of. And often we've heard that over and over again, Brother Elmer. And yet we walk out of a building the same as we were when we walked in. We never make the decision that God wants us to make. We never make the choice that God wants us to make. We never listen to that voice that God is speaking to us with. And we never make the decision to say, God, I want what you want for my life. There are many people who've sat in church year after year after year for all of their life and, and they have more knowledge of what the Bible says and yet their life is in direct opposition of what God says is right. They have a knowledge but never able to come to the truth. And there comes a time in our life when God says, I'm going to give you what you want. The Bible says that the ark of the Lord was taken. We know that ark in Scripture represents the presence of God. You remember in the Old Testament when the children of Israel traveled in the wilderness after they left Egypt, that that ark of the Lord, remember when they, when they were, went, went into the, to, to the promised land, the, the priests took and they, they, they carried that ark and they stepped into the Jordan River. And when they stepped into the Jordan River, it dried up. The ark of the Lord, that ark of, of God represented the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It represented the power of God. It represented the, the purpose of God in their life. And friend, can I say something to you? When God deals with your life, when a child, when a, when a child of God, when a, when a person trusts Jesus Christ and they become saved, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in their life and our body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. And listen to me, God gives us power and God gives us His presence and God gives us a presence purpose in life and he gives us direction but if we won't yield to it if we won't listen to it if we won't surrender to it God says fine I'll give you what you want now let me stop for just a moment and say this anybody who's trusted Jesus Christ as Savior according to the word of God is always a child of God if there's been a time in your life when you realize you were lost and you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, if there's ever been that time when you put your faith and trust in Him, I'm so thankful that when I, when I received the Lord Jesus Christ, when I accepted His free gift of salvation, that there is nothing on this side of eternity or on the other side of eternity that can ever take that away. I'm a child of God. But the direction and purpose of your life Can change because we say no to God and God says I'll leave you with it I've seen people who've taken their life that have been blessed beyond measure I've seen people who've been given a wonderful gift and they've ruined it because they thought they could do it without God 
I've seen people who sit in church all their life that begin to take advantage of the blessing and the grace and the goodness of the Lord. And I watch God, as the pastor said to me, just get up and leave. And so many times in our life, we, we've heard it over and over again. You shall know the truth. You shall know the truth. You shall know the truth. And you sit in church every week. You sit in church and you hear preaching and you hear teaching. You go to a class or, or you let the word of God impact your life. And you know the truth. But you've never been made free. Because you're too self-consumed with your own idea of what you believe is right and what you believe is wrong. The Bible says, that she said, I'm going to name him Ichabod because the glory is departed. I wonder how many Christians sit in churches this morning and the glory is departed from their home. I wonder how many Christians, individuals sit in a room this morning and they hear the truth of God's word. And, and the, the fact of the matter is this, that God's nowhere near them. I wonder how many churches are wondering why nothing is happening and, and God is not working and, and the hand of God is not moving. I wonder how many people in churches are, that, that takes place this morning and, and they're meeting together and there's a group that's gathered together but there's nothing taking place because God is not present. He's written Ichabod across the door. And the glory's departed. Say, Pastor Brian, God has certainly been good to us. And I would say amen to that. God is certainly blessed. I look across this building this morning and I look across this room this morning and I see many people and I look at their lives and I, I think God is good. I look at a ministry. I look at what God has allowed us to accomplish and God is through us accomplished. And, and I praise God for that and I think God is certainly good. But I can tell you, it doesn't take but just one wrong decision. It doesn't take but one wrong direction for us to begin to head towards the destination of Ichabod. You say, Pastor Brian, God is a God of grace. He certainly is. The Bible introduces this man, Eli, in, in 1 Samuel chapter number 1. And Israel's getting ready to want a king. They're getting ready to, to, to crown a king and... You, you know who the first king was. It was King Saul. The Bible said that Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody else. He was a strong man, a well-built man, a man that many people looked up to. And Israel was getting ready to have the king, and God was getting ready to give them what they wanted. But I wonder how often in our life do we ask God or, or do we, we ask for what we want instead of asking God what he wants? I wonder how often in our life we begin to prepare the way for our lives and for our families and for our children to arrive at a destination, that destination of Ichabod where God is no longer present. Say, Pastor Brian, that never happened to me. It'll never be me. It'll never be my home. It'll never be my marriage. It'll never be my church. It'll never be my ministry. It'll never be my family. It'll never be me. Eli was the man of God. The Bible said he had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. The Bible, as a matter of fact, I can, I, can, I can imagine Eli probably had hopes and dreams for his sons. As a matter of fact, they worked, they, they worked in the ministry. They worked in a place where people would look and say, hey, those two boys, they're going to become exactly what they should be. But in their hearts, on the inside where only God saw, it was a different story. Can I say to you this morning, I can only see the outside of your life. I can only see what's going on, on the outside. But God sees everything. God sees it all. God sees your heart. God sees your life. God sees when no one else sees. And if you think for one minute that you can accomplish and live life without God's help successfully, you just try. And it won't take long before you'll recognize the glory is departed. There's nothing. 
I've been given and blessed with so much. And just like Hawkeye and Phineas, there's nothing. The Bible says that the man of God comes to Eli and he says, your two sons are going to die in the same day. Nothing. You know what life, you know, you know the destination that, that life arrives at without God? It's nothing. You know why there's emptiness? You know why people are searching for something? You know why this world is so messed up? Because we're trying to find hope and help and everything else, but the only place that we can genuinely find it. The glory is departed. It seems like God just got up and he left. I want to give you three things very quickly this morning that lead us to this destination. I'll tell you how we arrive at this place. I'm going to give you the Bible, not my opinion, but I'm going to give you what the Bible says about how we arrive at this destination. You say, it just happens. No, it doesn't just happen. It's just life. No, it's not just life. Every one of us are products of the decisions that we make. And every one of us are personally responsible for the decisions that we make. I'm going to say that again because that's something this culture knows nothing about. Every one of us are products of the decisions that we make. Not the decisions that somebody else makes for us, but the decisions that we make. And every one of us are personally responsible for the decisions that we make. This morning, you're going to hear a message, and you know what? You're going to be a product of the decision that you make. This morning, you're going to hear a message, and you're going to be personally responsible for the decisions that you make. You are. Not the person sitting next to you, not the person down the row, not person sitting in the back or in the front, not this preacher, but you're going to be personally responsible for the decisions that you make. The Bible says, if you look with me in chapter number 2, we arrive at this destination of Ichabod, 1 Samuel chapter number 2, where the glory is departed, where it seems like God just got up and left. Let me stop for just a moment and say this. I, I never want to emphasize or I never want to give the glory to, to anything else other than God. Amen. God deserves all the credit and God des all, deserves all the glory. We talk about the culture that we live in and we know it's a wicked time. We know it's so. How many would say amen to that? It's a wicked time. We live in a culture that's wicked. Man, the Bible says evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. But I can tell you this. That there is a God in heaven that with the, with the snap of his finger, with one word, with one thought, with one direction, could change everything. We live, in a, we live in a world that is, that is wicked, but we serve a God that is far greater than the world that we live in. We live in a world that is terrible in the actions of men, the ideas of men, and it's not going to get any better. But friend, I serve a God that can change the ideas and the actions of men. I serve a God that can still save sinners. I serve a God that can still put homes back together and send revival. I serve a God that can still do great and mighty things. But if we're not careful, we'll arrive at Ichabod. Where God says, I'll give you what you want. You see, we can never have what we want and be successful if it opposes what God wants. Two things cannot be different and they both be true. Did you understand? Two things cannot be different and both be true. We arrive at Ichabod like this. Number one, I want you to write it down. Because no matter where you are, and I'm not speaking specifically about a ministry. I'm speaking specifically to individuals this morning. We arrive at Ichabod, number one, when we lose the respect for the righteousness of God. When we lose respect for the righteousness of God. The Bible says, look in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel. Are you there? Look there in your Bible. I want you to see it. Chapter 2, verse number 27. The Bible says in verse number 27, And there came a man of God unto Eli. And there came a man of God unto Eli. I'm sorry, verse number 12, not 27. The Bible says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. Get this. And they knew not the Lord. They knew not the Lord. You know what, this, you know what Eli's job was to do? They were to watch over the house of God. 
They were to take care of what belonged to God. They were to take care of the ark of God. And the Bible says that they knew not the Lord. They were sons of Belial. That word Belial has many different meanings. And, 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 and the best way that I can, I can give it to you is, is this. The, the sons of Belial meant they were the personification of evil. They were wicked. They were worthless. I'm talking about, I'm talking about two boys that grew up under good preaching. They grew up going to church. They grew up sitting in the house of God. They grew up knowing what God desired and what God expected and what God said was right. You see, it's not our righteousness that makes us okay in the sight of God. It is the righteousness of the Son of God that makes us okay. And these young men knew the truth. They heard preaching. They heard what was right. But then they lost a respect for the righteousness of God. Stop for just a minute. We live in a world today that has lost respect for righteousness. Listen to me. We live in a world today that is wicked and evil. We talked about that already. But the problem is not that the world is wicked. The problem is not that, that the world is, is terrible. The problem is not that evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. The problem is, is that God's people have lost a respect for righteousness. They've lost a respect for the righteousness of God. Stop for just a moment. Sit up, young men. Pay attention. Listen to me. We, li we live in a world today where we want to make God everybody's buddy. Where we want to make God your pal. Sit down and, and, and chew the bubble gum and chew the fat and just have a good time with God. That's not the God of the Bible. The Bible says, be holy, for I am holy. Understand something. There's not a man, woman, boy, and girl in this room, including this preacher, that is where they should be with the Lord Jesus Christ because God's command is to be holy. There was times in our culture where preachers would get up and they would preach that thought and men and women, boys and girls would desire to be exactly what God wanted them to be. Now men of God get up and they say, be holy. God said, be holy for I am holy. And they're ridiculed and they're mocked and they're made fun of and they said, hey, that preacher's crazy. He's lost his mind. What's happened? We've lost respect for the righteousness of God. We serve a God that is holy. Friend, God is not your pal. He's not your buddy. He's not the guy that you walk up to and high five. He's the God of heaven that sent his only son to die in your place because of our wickedness. You better understand who God is. You may leave here and not understand this preacher. You may leave here and you may not understand why we do certain things, but you better understand who God is. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father. No one gets to God but by me. We've lost a respect for righteousness. I'll tell you what our country needs. You say, well, that country needs to get right. Well, you're right, but they need for God's people to get right. They need for God's people to get back and recognize exactly what God has done for them, how God has changed their life. You know why we have so many Christians Christians that are choosing to sin, we don't fall into sin, we choose to sin. You know why? We have so many Christians that are choosing to sin and they're choosing the wrong direction, they're choosing the wrong path. It's because we love our sin, we love ourselves more than we love our God. God says, you want that? I'm not important in your life. I don't matter what I think, my opinion is not important. Here's what he says, I'll leave you with it. Oh, what a dangerous place to be. Peter stepped out of the boat. Lord, if it's you, bid me come. Lord, if it's you, bid me come. And Peter got out and began to walk on water. We give Peter a hard time. But nobody else but him and Jesus walked on water. The Bible says he began to walk. But here's what happened. He began to get his eyes on everything else around him. He took them off the Lord. And what happened? He began to sink. Now, what if God would have said, too bad, Peter. You lost everything. Some of you are on the verge of losing everything because you think you can do it without God. You've forgotten who God is. The second, the second way we arrive at this destination is number one, we lose a respect for righteousness. Number two, we lose that reliance. 
I'm sorry, we lose that respect for righteousness, but secondly, we, re- we retreat from godly principles. Look in verse number 27, if you would, please. We, we lose the respect of righteousness, but we retreat from godly principles. Look in verse number 27. And the Bible says, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I... Look at the next word. What is it? Let's try that again. Verse number, verse number uh, 27. He says, look at it with me there. And there came a man of God unto Eli, and he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, did I, what's the next word? Plainly. Plainly. What does he say? Plainly appear in the house of thy father, and when they were in Egypt and in Pharaoh's house, and did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear the ephod before me, And did I give unto the house of the Father all the offerings made by the fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice, and at mine offering which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. I'm going to tell you what happens right here. God changes his mind. He says, I've called you, he said, to be my priest, to offer my sacrifice, to take care of my house, and to honor me. But now, what happened? You see, Eli began to be more concerned about his sons than he did what God wanted. He began to be more concerned about his self, his self-image, rather than being concerned about God's specific plan in his life. You see, God has a specific plan for you. I said just a moment ago, you cannot, you cannot live successfully for God without God's help. Amen. And when you begin to run and you begin to, you begin to lose respect for the righteousness of God and just how important He should be in, in, in your life, then you begin to change the principles that you live by. You begin to justify how you behave. You begin to justify how you act. You begin to make an excuse and, and blame it all on everybody else. And we begin to retreat from godly principles. We begin to treat, retreat from things like honesty, faith, truth. You see, I can't help anybody who don't believe this book's truth. I'm not giving you my idea. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm not giving you what I believe is right and how I feel and, and what I think. No, no, I'm giving you truth. Amen. And when you begin to debate this and we, debate this, and you begin to, de- to doubt this and you begin to change the, the godly principles that you know you ought to be living by, when they become unimportant to you, then where are you going to find truth? Where are you going to find the truth that will set you free? You begin to change the principles that you live by and things that used to be important to you are no longer important to you. Serving God, being surrendered to God, using God's, following God's plan in your life, being obedient to the Lord. Those things used to be important and now because of all the things that have taken place and all the ideas that men and women and boys and girls have about what is right, rather than coming to the truth of what is actually right, they begin to change the way they live. We have to pull teeth to get people to work in the nursery. We have to pull teeth to find Sunday school teachers to help teach kids. We have to offer offer, uh, extravagant guidelines and rewards for people to be faithful to God. No, there ought to be a desire in your heart to live for God and serve God because of what Christ has done for for you. And when you begin to change those principles in your life, you begin to head for a place where Ichabod's written over the door. The glory is departed. God says, I'll, I'll give it to you. I said just a moment ago, the Philistines were the enemies of God, right? They, 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 they slaughtered 30,000 of God's people. And they took the ark of the Lord. They placed it in a place called Dagon.
God says, I'll give you what you want. God says, I'll just leave you alone, let you try to figure it out. The last thing will be done. All of this led to one, and all of these decisions led to a culmination of one event. The Bible says they went to war against the Philistines. I'm not even going to take the time to preach it, but I want you to listen. They went to war against the Philistines. Here's what happened. The ark of God was in Shiloh. The Bible says that the, the nation of Israel went to war against the Philistines. Now, if you go back a few books, you'll find that the nation of Israel had already been to war with many people. And the Bible says that, that any time the nation of Israel went anywhere, the ark of the Lord went with them. Why? Because it was always a symbol of the presence of God. You got it? The ark of the Lord was always a symbol of the presence of God. And the Bible says that now the nation of Israel decided we don't need God anymore. We're just going to park the ark over here. And we're going to go to war against the Philistines. And guess what happens? They realize they're not going to win this war. So here's what they do. Hey, I know a good emergency room doctor. 1-800-SHILOH. Hey, send the ark down here. Why? Well, we need to win a battle, so just send the ark. Bring the ark. Instead of God leading, instead of God giving direction, instead of God being the guide, here comes the nation of Israel, and they start telling God what they want Him to do. How many of us have ever done that? Now, God, here's what I need you to do. Now, God, this is what you want. This is what I, that's what I want you to do, God. Now, I need this and this and this and this. Just bring the ark over, God. I need a victory right here. Instead of stopping and saying, God, what is it that you want? God, what's the direction that you have for my life? Here's, here's how it ends right here. When we, when we lose respect for the righteousness of God and we retreat from godly principles, we'll see this guaranteed every time according to the Bible. There will be a removal of God's power. The nation of Israel didn't just lose a battle. The Bible says it was a great slaughter. I'm talking about the people, the people, Brother Nick, that just a few chapters ago, the entire world feared because God's hand was upon them. A people, just a few chapters ago, Brother Elmer, that were in great, great blessing. God had blessed. I'm going to make it very practical, practical for you. A people that just, just one book ago, Brother Elmer, were supporting missionaries. Building buildings. Giving. Seeing people saved. People joining the church. Wonderful music being sung and wonderful blessings taking place. And God's goodness was present. And God's, God's power was present. Just a few books before this. And the Bible says that the Israelites in one battle, 30,000 men died. And the enemies of God came in and took the power of God from the people of God. He said, that's what happened. Read it. The Bible says the Philistines took it and they put it in their own false temple. There was a removal of the power of God. You know why there's no victory in so many lives today? There's no God. You know why we struggle often with things that keep tripping us up over and over and over and over again? It's because we're not fighting those battles with God's power. God has said, you fought for so long, I'll leave you alone. You got this on your own. You don't need me anymore. Let's go ask Israel. Let's go ask Israel after, after 1 Samuel passage we just read there. How'd that work out? Eli's gone. Hophni and Phinehas is gone. The ark of the Lord is gone. 30,000 individuals. Those families are all affected. The power of God is gone. The very, listen, it wasn't the ability of Israel that made them powerful. It was the presence of God. Amen. The very source of all their strength, gone. What's God do? I'll tell you what He does. He starts over. Remember Samuel? Remember Eli? He, he, his, he, he, thought, he thought Hannah was drunk. 
Man, you're just uttering words. What's the problem? She said, I'm not uttering words. I'm praying. And the Bible says that God blessed Samuel. You read through that passage from 1 Samuel chapter 1 to 1 Samuel chapter number 5. You'll find the story of Eli, Hothni, and Phinehas, and the children of Israel. But you'll also find the story of a man named Samuel. And throughout the whole passage, here's what you'll find. Samuel walked with God. Samuel served the Lord. Samuel talked with God. You know what God did? He started over. You think for one moment you can accomplish and live successfully in this world without God's help. You go ahead and think it. And God says, I'll leave you alone. And you know where you'll wind up? You'll wind up in the same place Israel did when God wrote Ichabod. The glory is departed. What a sad, sad truth to have a family, have a, have a home, have a life that's been taught the truth, the Word of God, the principles of God's Word. And then we get our eyes off the Lord and God says, I'll leave you alone. You don't need me anymore. And you're left with just a shell of what used to be, or even worse, what could have been. Let's pray together, may we? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. No one's looking around.